because it's anesthesia's judgment call if the patient is safe to go back for surgery and to have the anesthetic done. And if they're not, and they're not appropriately worked up, then it's our job to stop it and say, this surgery can't happen today. This is not appropriate. The patient's not optimized or the appropriate labs have not been done or these things are out of order and it's not the best idea to do this Ooh, today. I gotta go. I've been working, told them, please don't hit my phone. I'm in my zone, bro, just leave me alone. Was on the road, but I swear I'm coming home. Now the drinks on me, I think we need a toast. See, I did it for me. Now my old friends calling, told them nothing's for free. Told me time is money, dog, I swear I paid on my fees. I was starving for this day, now my fan, they can't eat. Welcome, everyone. Another episode of the Couple Nurses Podcast with your host, Matt, and myself, Peter. Make sure y'all subscribe to us on YouTube. Subscribe to us on Spotify as well. Make sure you check out the videos. Both platforms should have videos on there. We're also on Apple Podcasts, but there's no video available for that yet. Um, if you guys are looking at us on a video, Matt's got the Inhale Exhale shirt that's available on FrontlineWarriors.shop. Um, it's our sister site. Also has a lot of mindfulness, wellness, consciousness related blog posts on there and we're slowly growing up up on that site um here every week we're gonna have a little bit more more going on and of course shirt that i'm wearing it's a couple nurses shirt available on couple nurses dot shop and all our show notes all our blogs all our nursing related information is, is all available on couple of nurses.com we'll literally keep everything over there for y'all to look at travel checklist and study guides merch anything you guys could think of is probably on there and something that has been in the works slowly being released right now is pronto uh it's at prontohealth.com and something that we've been all working on dig- diligently and you could say quietly in the background it's a website and app that we are creating uh to revolutionize and innovate the healthcare industry it's going to revolutionize the way uh we do we do the travel healthcare ner- industry and nursing in general finding a job trying to find schools and just trying to keep all your documents in one area. We're trying to simplify that whole um, healthcare industry process for the, for the healthcare worker, just to make things a little bit easier on your end because it could get a little, bit, a little bit complicated and a little bit overwhelming, especially when you're just starting off being a nurse or when you're just transitioning into travel nursing. But what's going on, Matt? How are you doing? So many exciting stuff happening right now, going to be happening. But anyway, in today's episode, I'd like to introduce our guest, Jason Bolt, DNP slash CRNA. Jason is not only a nurse anesthesiologist, he also has a YouTube channel called Bolt CRNA, where he offers mentorship and helps people behind the scenes and to look at the life of a CRNA. In this episode, we talk a lot about CRNA, his day-to-day life, what it is to be a anesthesia provider, a lot of great tips, information about what it's like to experience that role he goes in depth and we go off topic talk about school talk about dating jam-packed episode you guys ready hey jason welcome to the show for being a reoccurring guest can you give us a little background about yourself and what you do yeah thanks guys for having me on uh i am a crna who practices in the bay area in california Um, I have a YouTube channel and I do Instagram and I do mock interviews for for students trying to get into CRNA school. And so I kind of dabble in the professional anesthesia world and in the social media world. And before we started the show, we talked a little bit about how your kind of process is in being a CRNA because your path is a little bit different. You have like the whole S Corp going on and you kind of flow from from, uh, one facility to another and you kind of figure out your own hours. So can you go a little bit into depth like about that whole thing and how you got that started? Sure, so I originally you know, graduated school and went and did the typical W-2 position that most people do. It's very safe, it's very regulated. You know exactly how much you're gonna get paid every week, you know exactly how many hours you're gonna week, you're gonna be on call, that type of thing. And I'd say that's the majority of people who work in, in you know, as a nurse or as a CRNA or a physician or anything like that. But recently in December, I switched over to 1099, which is a, like a tax designation, but essentially usually t- 1099 means you pretty much create your own hours. You create contracts or just agreements with employers um, like surgery centers or even sometimes hospitals or freestanding clinics. And you say, I'm willing to work these days for you guys 
but there's no long-term commitments. There's no official contracts to it. They say, we're willing to pay you typically a day rate. They'll say, hey, I'll give you $1,500 for seven or eight hours of your time each time you want to come in. And then whatever amount of days you work for them in the week, they, they just cut you a check for that amount. And there's no benefits. You provide your own benefits. And they have no guarantees to you know provide you with hours. If they don't want you next week anymore and they just don't care to have you come back, they can tell you that we don't need you back here anymore. Or you can vice versa say, I don't feel comfortable here. I don't want to work here anymore. And you don't have to do business with them. So that's what I do now. It's kind of cool because you could be your own boss in this sense. And just like you mentioned, not a lot of people take the W-2 route and go that route. So when did you learn about this? Is this something that people in the industry started telling you about? Or is this something that school tells you, CRNA school? I knew about this when I was in CRNA school. I feel like most people know about you either can be 1099 or W-2. I don't know if back in the day, years and years ago, it was this popular of a thing, but definitely when I went to school in 2016, 17, 18, it was a topic of conversation that you could be your own boss, essentially for the same reasons you guys you know, mentioned, it sounds nice and lucrative. You can control your own destiny. You go through all of this training and education and, and debt, uh, and you finish with your doctorate in nurse anesthesiology, and you kind of want to create your own destiny at that point and control your own schedule. And for many years at that point in your life and career, you've had other people telling you, we want you here at this hour and leaving at this hour. And you can only have this much vacation and you can only take it when we allow you to have it. And all of these types of controlling mechanisms in bigger systems. So that was really something that was uh, standing out to me when I was graduating. But when you do 1099, you really have to be a full service anesthesia provider in the sense that uh, you, there's not really orientation. There's not as much mentorship. They, uh, you're a contract worker. You're essentially like an anesthesia mercenary. You're, you're brought in to provide a service quickly, efficiently, full practice. They're not, there's no one there to help you or hold your hand. Uh, similar in, in this type of idea with travel nursing that you guys have experienced where they don't expect to hire a travel nurse in and pay them a premium and they come in and they need three or four weeks of orientation and assistance and being trained on the CRT machines and being trained on how to you know, give certain types of drugs or how to titrate or how to manage sick patients. Uh, and it's a similar way with 1099. They expect you to be able to do it on your own. So when I first graduated, and like most students, or when you first graduate, you usually go to a W-2 job. It's a little more regimented, a little more structured. There's more support systems, a little bit more mentorship abilities. And, and then a lot of times, I'd say two years in or so, like myself, you transition if you want. Mm. So what are kind of like your, your day to days? You, you said you flew, flew onto a few facilities. Um, are any of those facilities like hospitals or is it just more of like outpatient kind of surgeries? So for my 1099 work right now, I just do like freestanding surgery centers, uh, plastic surgery, GI clinics, um, eye cases, orthopedic surgery is a huge thing. Lots of orthopedic surgery being done outpatient and they need lots of anesthesia providers. Mm. Um, what else do we do? Podiatry, uh, you know, of course you'll do some general surgery stuff and uh, pain procedures, lots of pain procedures and all of that. Mm. And so, yeah, I would say I do a lot of that as my 1099 work, but I still maintain a per diem position with my previous W-2 employer, which is a larger hospital system. And I go back there and I'll do a little bit of uh, I'll, one or two days a month. I'll, I'll drop in there and help them out with staffing. And I will do like OB cases where you may you won't really be doing a lot of epidurals and OB type cases in a freestanding surgery center. So you might keep a job per diem somewhere where you can keep your skills doing a little bit more the OB or maybe some pediatrics or maybe some more complex types of cases in, in a bigger hospital. That, that's actually a question I was going to ask. How does your anesthesia practice differ from the rural areas, less hospital-based versus working in the city with a large provider? Yeah. So, I mean, actually, the surgery centers that I work for are still in the urban areas right nearby, um, but they, they are just freestanding clinics. But uh, the practices change because in a bigger hospital system, you're going to have an entire team of, of personnel. You're going to have physician anesthesiologists, you're going to have CRNAs, you're going to have a slew of anesthesia techs who help you out. 
Um, you know, there's lots of nurses and all over the place that you're meeting and, and there's management and administration who are all making rules and regulations and all of these things. But in the smaller setting, like a surgery center, uh, it's just each provider for themselves. Essentially, there are no managers. There are no people, you know, guiding you or telling you go here and do this now and, you know, only do this type of protocol or things like that. You, you kind of make your own rules within safe practice and everyone's expected to practice the top of their license. So there, there are no physician anesthesiologists as a CRNA who oversees me or guides me. Uh, if I want to do a peripheral nerve block, I do that peripheral nerve block for my patient. Uh, it's very much a conversation with me and the surgeon based off of the case and what, what the surgeon's looking for and what I'm looking for and what the patient wants. And so you provide your own pre-op anesthetics, you prescribe your own pre-op meds, you intra-op manage your patient, you prescribe PACU drugs and management for your patient. If there's a problem in PACU, instead of calling like in a larger hospital system, there'll be a specific person assigned to PACU from the anesthesia team who's like managing those patients. But in the freestanding surgery center, uh, surgery center world, they'll just call you if there's something wrong with your patient and say, you know, can you come fix this or what do you think? And so it's a lot more responsibility, but we're trained to do that as CRNAs and, and I'll enjoy it. Mm. So it seems like you're like the Navy SEAL of your profession of just going to these areas and taking care of business, uh, just like the travel nurses in a sense. So how much years of experience for somebody listening that wants to be a CRNA should get before they take this S Corp route and be more independent? Well, I would say it depends on where you're training at. Certain schools, there's probably a hundred, a little over a hundred CRNA training programs in the United States. and they all will produce good, high quality, safe CRNAs when they come out, and that's a baseline expectation. But there are definitely certain programs that have a stronger leaning towards independence and full autonomy and practice outside of care team settings. And then there are other programs that are maybe tied to a bigger academic hospital where they do a lot of their rotations at these bigger academic hospitals. They do a lot of their training and education within a care team. In those types of CRNAs who graduate from those schools, they may have a much harder time transitioning to a full independent level like this. Uh, I was lucky enough and I purposefully sought out a training program that had a lot of its rotations in CRNA only practices. And a lot of the professors had backgrounds in CRNA only independent practice. And they had a lot of peripheral nerve block experience and they taught that to us. So a lot of people from my school actually graduated and went into an independent type role and a few actually went straight to 1099 out of school uh, i did not choose to do that i went to like a semi kind of collaborative mode where there are physician anesthesiologists and other crnas around to mentor you but they're not hovering over you they're not in your room when the patient's going to sleep they're not in your room when the patient's waking up they're not you know managing all these decisions for you you get some level of autonomy um, but they're backup for you if you need them, which I think is the perfect environment for a new, any person who's new into the anesthesia world out of training, whether it be a CRNA or a physician, I think that's best to go into an environment where you're able to stretch your legs and, and use your muscles in anesthesia and let them grow, but you also have backup because there will always be situations that will come up that seem odd or that you haven't come across before. So it's nice to have backup. I would say probably two years of practicing in an environment like that and say you're ready to go. You you have no reason that you shouldn't be able to go out and be a full service anesthesia provider. Yeah, I 100% agree. That's like the the best route of, of education instead of uh, doing that other school route you mentioned. I think that the best route is the route that you went to where you looked at a school and at the clinicals and whatever you're required to, to do and pick the most independent process because once you graduate school, you don't have you're not you're not you're not sheltered anymore you you have to practice on your own and being able to do that throughout school i feel like better prepares people for any type of career and i think that's one of the reasons why people go into crna school is because they want to be more independent because as nurses we don't really have a whole lot of independence we have to always kind of take orders from doctors and a lot of people choose a crna route because they want more of like independence and the only way you're going to build that independence is you actually go to a school that doesn't really have people hovering around you and 
you having the ability to ask them every single question for just, just to be verified as a yes because we know a lot of answers to our questions we just sometimes we ask people so we want them to to hear yes that we're that we're correct and it's not the best way to build independence you got to be somewhere we got to think on your own and kind of execute execute on your own and then have somebody there as a backup but every time I talk to a CRNA, they always have like their own cocktail of medications for like light sedation or for general anesthesia and all that. So you, you did talk about briefly that you could choose your own medications with these facilities, but do some of them maybe allow you to choose only a certain amount of drugs or do they have like a list of recommendation choices, recommended choices they have to choose from? How does that work? And what's like your, your cocktail of choice? That's a great question because actually they, they don't mm -hmm. regulate um, what you choose to give, but what you will find in these smaller clinics is there are times where they don't stock certain meds because they're expensive. So cost is something that you really don't face a whole lot when you're in a bigger hospital system. You have a lot of resources in big hospital systems and they stock every medicine, even rare and obscure and expensive ones. They are fully stocked and you typically can use them to your heart's extent as a CRNA or physician anesthesiologist. And no one's really going to tell you no. Mm -hmm. But in the small um, freestanding clinics, everything is kind of an expense and anesthesia is an expense. You know, we, we they do get reimbursed well for our services, but the medicines we use, the equipment we use, ultrasound machines, everything that we um, interact with costs a lot of money. So there will be times where they will um, just not stock certain things. And an example of that is one of the surgery centers that I do go to, they don't stock Presidex. Mm -hmm. Presidex is it's not very expensive now, but it used to be quite expensive. And I think they just were on the trend of not having it when it was an, um, when there was not an off-label uh, use or drug uh, name for it. So it used to be quite expensive. They don't stock it still, which is one of my favorite drugs, like you mentioned in my uh, kind of cocktail that a lot of people like to use for their sedation cases or max sedation cases. Uh, Presidex is one that I do like to use a lot, and I just don't have it at that. When I'm there, you have to learn to kind of um, be very, uh, I don't know, jack of all trades or yeah, use some ingenuity because you can't actually use the drug that you're typically used to using Ketamine is another one that a different surgery center, for whatever reason, they just they say it's back ordered because I keep begging them for it. And I actually have given the nurses a hard time because I'm like, why is this not stocked here? I need ketamine. And they're like, we just it's back ordered. We're we're on it, we're on it. But sometimes they just don't have it. So you have to figure out other things to use. But to answer your question, no, nobody's there to tell you because you're the anesthesia provider. So you make the call on what drugs you want to use or not use, mm -hmm. but they just may not order it or stock it for that facility because it costs too much money. So you have to figure out something else in that situation. Mm. Oh, regarding regarding ketamine, uh, you said you, you use it quite frequently and you prefer it if it's if it's there. Uh, what are some like the benefits of it? Because not a lot of, I feel like, at least in the ICU, not a lot of people, not a lot of physicians or CRNAs uh, use ketamine for anything. I maybe administered it, I want to say once. I maybe had a patient on drip. There's only one hospital that I've worked with ketamine, mm. that's it, yeah. from all my travel experience. Yeah. But I've heard, like, uh, not heard, I've read some research that it has, it's a lot more beneficial than, than other medications to use in, in sedation. So I'm not sure why just to get like a disconnect from the, the, the research and to, like the actual medical uh, practice. So I'll tell you the reason I love ketamine the most, it doesn't depress respiratory drive. So if you're doing a MAC, you want them sleepy, but you don't want them to stop breathing. That's the whole opposite approach. Uh, you want them breathing as much as possible because that's what, if you're doing sedation, that's the, um, you know, the crux of that is you're supposed to be breathing without me making you breathe. And if you stop breathing, that's a big problem. So ketamine is great for that. And ketamine also has a lot of um, analgesic effects which is very nice for patients because, of course, surgery procedure-wise, that's a pain stimulation. So if you use ketamine, you're going to block that while also they're going to continue to breathe. I don't use ketamine on its own, though, because it does have some weird side effects, and some patients will um, actually get a little panicky, and they can start to have some what's called dysphoria with ketamine, especially in higher dosages of it. So I usually like to pair it with Versed. Mm. So that kind of helps smooth them out a little bit and even some propofol. So if you pair in a little bit of, I like to do half milligram per kilogram of dosage on ketamine or less. I usually start less than that. And that's usually my top uh, amount that I'll give to somebody for, for sedation reasons. Um, 
And if you go beyond that, which I have before, just you have to be aware that you you may run into some dysphoria and other weird side effects. But essentially, I like it because it's pain reliever, sedative, but also um, gives um, that good drive to continue breathing that a lot of our other anesthetics actually don't do. Most of our other anesthetics will depress the respiratory drive and can be problematic. Does your strategy change when it comes to anesthesia uh, for shorter and longer uh, surgeries? Let's just say a quick gynae procedure versus uh, an abdominal procedure, which might take an hour depend or hours, depending on what's going on. Definitely, because anything you give you then have to reverse or wait for it to wear off in anesthesia. So if you are extremely heavy handed with a lot of drugs and you have a bunch of Dilaudid and ketamine and heavy amounts of, um, you know, gases and everything like that. And then the case is over in 15 minutes, that patient is going to sleep forever. Like you're not going to be able to remove the airway. You're not going to be able to get them breathing on their own, uh, especially in a surgery center environment where that patient is supposed to go home in an hour. You know, they're supposed to be getting in the car leaving. So you dose them to where they're high out of their head for the next five hours and, and they're going to be in the recovery room totally conked out. You have really shot yourself in the foot and the patient. That's not fair to that patient. That patient wanted to go home in an hour. So now you now you're going to have to deal with that fact that they're going to sit there. And the nurses who are staffed in PACU are not staffed to hold a patient for five hours. They're staffed to hold someone about 30 to 45 minutes and then, you know, get them to their car. So you've messed everything up if you do that. And especially in the later hours, like I was telling you, there might be three providers, anesthesia providers there in the whole surgery center. And we're all in three different ORs doing our own cases, managing our own PACU patients. If you're the last person there, it's three or 4 PM, everyone else went home and you give way too much of Dilaudid or something. And that patient's sitting in the recovery room, just snoring and you can't leave. You have to wait because you're the last provider there. You can't leave the nurses there alone with that patient in that clinic. You have to wait there until that patient starts breathing on their own and is awake and is getting ready to go home and is safe. Uh, so that's something you just have to consider when you're doing, you know, these surgery centers independently is how much you're giving and is this an inappropriate amount. Mm -hmm. As that also, do you take also um, kidney function into consideration and liver function with all these uh, sedation medications? If, I mean, if they have a history of liver damage and there's significant reason, I don't, there's not much that we give that would cause severe, um, you know, interactions with your liver. If you have some kind of um, background of severe liver disease, that's something you'll take into account in pre-op and you'll, you'll, you know, tailor your anesthetic for that if you need to. Mm -hmm. It's so awesome hearing your perspective about anesthesia. I'm just like this whole time putting myself in the shoes because my day to day in the hospital is so much different than yours. Like we kind of check up on our patients, vital signs, meds, and there's a standard practice for you every single day. It's changing based on what you're doing, the patients that you have, and you're making your cocktail and managing the event. So that's awesome. Yeah, it definitely can uh, be different with my newer role in, in the larger hospital systems. When you've got a whole team of people, you have a lot of people to fall back on. If you have questions, like you said, you come in and you, you assess your first patient of the day, which is typically how your workflow goes. You, you do your pre-op assessment in the hospital system. You would do that assessment. And if something came up, like you were saying, like liver failure or something like that, you would be saying, well, have, have I looked at my LFTs? Like, have they drawn these labs? What's the most recent, you know, medications they're on? Are they being followed appropriately by their, you know, internal medicine doctor? And you're, you're looking at all these things and you're making a judgment call because it's anesthesia's judgment call. If the patient is safe to go back for surgery and to have the anesthetic done, and if they're not, and they're not appropriately worked up, then it's our job to stop it and say, this surgery can't happen today. This is not appropriate. The patient's not optimized or the appropriate labs have not been done or these things are out of order and it's not the best idea to do this today. Mm -hmm. So in the hospital system, you have lots and lots of staff around. You've got NPs and you've got uh, physician anesthesiologists and you've got more veteran CRNAs who have years of experience who they kind of, you can go to and say, hey, this is my case this morning. Something's 
off. I, I, this is a gray area. Should, should I say something about this? Should we cancel this? And you have a lot of that support and backup. And, and some of them may say, oh, no, no, like that's really not a big deal. Why you could just do this instead, or, or they'll give you ideas, or why don't we try this monitoring device and then it'll be safe as long as we do this. Or, and, and so you have that backup. But in the freestanding clinic, uh, you go in and you're it. If, if you you know, see something wrong or see some labs that are off or see a, a diagnosis or a problem that's happened with this patient that doesn't seem safe for this day, you have to make the decision on your own whether to cancel that case or continue on with the day. And if you do cancel that case, you then have to deal with the surgeon who the surgeon is not um, gonna be happy about that. In a private practice type clinic, they make their income based off of the cases they're doing. So if you cancel cases, they're not making money that day for that time period that you canceled those cases. And, and they also, that's their patient and that patient wants that leg surgery. They want that done because something's wrong and they want it fixed, of course. And the patient also probably wants it done. So as anesthesia in these freestanding places, you, you really do have to stand your ground. You have to really know what's appropriate to go back and not appropriate to go back. And occasionally you have to make those tough judgment calls and I've had, you know, probably had to do that three times in the last two months. So it's, it's not extremely infrequent that you have to say, hey, this, this is not a good idea today. And these are the reasons why. And, and that'll definitely change your whole workflow. Is there a different process um, with what you would do? For example, if you had somebody going in for like a scheduled surgery or versus like an emergent surgery where it's like emergent intubation and emergent surgery. Does that change up your process or maybe the, the meds you would use or any kind of thinking? Yeah, well, as far as emergencies go, that's gonna be in your hospital system where it's not, um, anything in the freestanding clinic is all gonna be elective, which means there's nothing emergent about this. If you need to reschedule or cancel, you can, so it's no big deal. Hospital system, there have definitely been times where I, you don't have a choice to cancel. The patient will, have, there's a trauma or there's something wrong and the patient is not optimized. The patient is not at the best place they need to be. They're hypotensive, they're bleeding, there's something very acutely wrong and you have no choice, but we're gonna have to put in a central line, an art line, start you know, levofed infusion. We're gonna do all these different types of um, techniques. And yes, you do tailor your anesthetic and your technique for those patients and you do it very quickly. And luckily in those bigger hospital systems, you're pretty much always, unless it's at two in the morning, which that does happen sometimes, um, but usually during the day, you're gonna have quite a few staff members there and uh, they'll jump in as a team and say, okay, I'll do the art line. You can start the second you know, IV. You can get to working on drawing up this type of you know, drip. A lot of times you won't have norepi drips and phenylephrine drips already pre-made, so you have to mix them yourself, which is something interesting we do in anesthesia. We, we, or kind of chemists back there in the OR and we mix a lot of drugs and sometimes we'll mix two different drugs together in the same syringe and we do a lot of mad scientist stuff uh, that we, we've we learned to be effective for our patients. But yeah, you'll definitely tailor your anesthetic for an emergent situation or a trauma. Okay, in your personal perspective, is it more difficult to get somebody sedated into a good point or is it harder to maintain their sedation? It's not difficult to get them sedated usually because I can just keep giving more. Mm -hmm. uh, it's funny because there's this TikTok where uh, Stacy uh, is another CRNA. She was talking about how much her infusion of her propofol was going at in the OR and all the ICU nurses who follow her were like, whoa, that is like four times our max dose that we ever give that like, you know, you hit a certain level that you'll titrate to in the ICU and you just stop at that point and you never go higher, but we'll go like four or five times higher than that in the OR. And it's because we will continue, we, we essentially use the phrase titrate to effect in anesthesia. We will continue to give you, uh, you know, what your body needs if your body is insisting on that amount to do what we need it to do. So for instance, if I'm supposed to give you two milligrams per kilogram, and say that should equal 200 milligrams of your, you know, 100 kilogram person. And I'm going to give you two milligrams per kilogram, which is like normal intubation dose, textbook dose. So I give you 200 milligrams and you are completely wide awake looking at me, which has definitely happened to me before. And you're thinking, okay, so I'm going to give you more. So I give you 50 more. And then you're like half still looking at me. Your eyes are still blinking. You're definitely not near level to be intubated yet. I'm going to give you another 50. 
there's been times where people are still looking at me. It's like, okay, so now we've gone a well above the textbook normal answer for what I should have to give someone. But I know your body's requiring more. Maybe you smoke marijuana three times a day and your body statistically is gonna require multiple times more profile than a normal patient because of that background. Hmm. Um, so in anesthesia, we definitely give a lot more and heavier amounts of certain types of drugs. Yep, so when you see Jason in the clinic, and if you've been smoking some weed, you gotta let him know because he's gonna know they ate some more propofol since it's an issue. <laughs> this is why it's important to like tell your doctor what you actually do. Like we don't care what you do or your doctor, your nurse or any kind of medical professional. We don't care what you do. We just gotta figure out what you're doing so we know what to do in case some shit hits the fan. The best care. Or we try to figure out, hey, why is this guy, you know, getting 300 or 400 milligrams of propofol an hour? You know, he said he's, he's an average person, but really he, he does drugs or whatever or, or other, other stuff and he just takes more is what it is i always ask that's mm -hmm. even if you're like a 74 four year old uh woman who looks shocked at me when i ask do you smoke cigarettes or marijuana i ask that explicitly in every single pre-op every time because mm -hmm. I, I have learned especially when i moved to california a few years ago i've learned that you know don't judge a book by its cover and you'll definitely find quite a few people many 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 people here who smoke marijuana frequently and if you ask people do you smoke they'll say no and you just move on but then you find out later oh they smoke marijuana every day mm. they thought you meant tobacco they don't they consider marijuana to be like water here so <laughs> it's not considered anything to report or talk about and it will definitely affect the anesthetic so i i specifically asked about marijuana yeah 100 100 um l reflecting back on your career and like your the time you've been a crna is there maybe one moment in particular that always sticks around with you that you took back as like a really good learning moment because for me, I'll never, I'll never forget probably this day ever in my life being a nurse. Uh, I was a new grad, and uh, this person had a had a just a, an introducer a port, and he had levo going through it. And I was going to I was going to DC the levo because he wasn't on it. Uh, he wasn't really he didn't really need it anymore. So he's been on zero for quite a bit of time. So I disconnected it and I flushed the the introducer, not realizing that in the introducer there was levo. And I saw this guy's blood pressure shoot up into like two hundreds like 300s over like 180s, 190s, I really thousand and killed this guy. And I mean, he came back down, he was fine, but it just shot up uh, just for like a few seconds. And I was like, that from that moment, I re like, I'll like i never ever make that mistake again. It was being a new grad and I didn't realize that, hey, there's actually medication still left in this. And if I'm gonna flush it, I gotta pull back some first before I flush the medication in. Yeah. So that was like, that's like for all ever going to stay with me. That's the one time I did, that's the one time I learned and I haven't not done it ever since. So have you had any of those kind of moments before? Not necessarily where you made a mistake or just, just like a good time you had as a CRNA where you learned something. So I had a patient, I was actually a third year at the time in training. And at that point, we were, you know, third year of my program, you're very independent. You pretty much run your room by yourself. Um, the CRNA would come in the room for induction when you put the patient to sleep and intubate. And then they may come back for emergence when you pull the tube and take the patient to recovery room. But essentially you're running the case by yourself with them, with their cell phone back up there in the lounge or somewhere close by if you need them. Uh, and I had a patient, uh, BMI probably like 40, and told me they had asthma in pre-op. And I thought, well, that's okay. We were gonna have to intubate. It was a general surgery. And I thought, it, it'll be fine. And, um, I did not ask them when, when the last time they used your, their inhaler was. And later I found out that was a mistake that I should have asked how often they're using their, their inhaler because it turned out that they could use their inhaler pretty much daily. Mm. Uh, but they had when they get, relayed the information that they had asthma, it seemed like it was very minimal and barely anything worth mentioning to them. And so we go back, we intubate, we do the case. As we're waking up, they start as they start lightening up on anesthesia a lot of times especially if you have very reactive airway um, with like severe asthma things like that or even moderate asthma um, patients can bronchospasm very quickly on that too and you will realize what it's like to try and ventilate a concrete block when someone with asthma like severely bronchospasms down mm. and you're suddenly realizing like your sats are dropping everything is going wrong like you're, you're they're blowing off their SIBO or that they've been in the process of blowing off their you know volatile anesthetic slowly waking up but now they're um, you know half awake their paralytics reversed and they're like reaching up and moving around but they're turning you know a bad color like a cyanotic looking color and you're not getting good tidal volumes and you know of course the CRNA runs in the room immediately at that point 
and uh, and is assisting me and i'm realizing that and then she hooks up a um albuterol inhaler and also gives a little bit of epi and some ketamine and some magnesium and all these things are pretty much going to bronchodilate but you realize how quickly a patient can go from normal everything's fine to extremely hypoxic you know cyanotic looking and um and then luckily you know she bronchodilated very quickly with all the methods that the crna did for me and uh, and i realized you know we could get back up to where we wanted to be pretty quick but in that moment I, I was I was really humbled by the idea that a patient who seemed relatively fine and normal, a super run of the mill typical case, could go from fine and almost ready to be extubated and through the woods to like really not fine, really bad situation. If the CRNA had not come in and done all those methods very quickly for me, things could have gotten very ugly. And uh, and so from that time on, I take. I take asthmatics very seriously. I ask specifically, similar to marijuana, I will specifically ask you if you have asthma. And if you use your inhaler at all recently, I give like prophylactic inhaler. I'm, I'm like, here's your inhaler your inhaler before we go to sleep. We're going to go ahead and use this. We're going to bronchodilate out. And we're just going to, and I keep the albuterol like on hand. I, I know where my epi is at. I know where my ketamine and my mag and everything's at. And it's, it's ready to go. And, and I take that very seriously now. So yep. that's Wow, that's those sticky healthcare situations, man. And that's why I'm a huge proponent of going and working for facilities like that, where you have like the the veteran CRNAs and everyone helping you and teaching you along the process because that's important. I've learned so much from veteran ICU nurses techniques and mm. how to better assess my patient, not to freak out in the moment and and think like a nurse. Yeah, because um, when you actually think about it, like we're I feel like a lot of nurses are, and just anybody in healthcare profession that's in like a stress situation, we let the stress get the best of us because we try to, like, we, we freak out and instead of realizing, hey, if we take the, you could say take the person out of it and emotions out of the situation, you can kind of figure out what's exactly going on. It's really tough to do, but I feel like if people take, take away the emotions and the actual patient being there and just thinking about what's actually going wrong, there are, it'll be a little bit easier for them to actually think through a situation and actually respond in an emergency situation. Yeah, and that even goes back to school test taking and maintaining composure and all that. And I know you, Jason, you have a lot of experience with helping and mentoring younger CRNAs or people going into uh, the CRNA programs. So what are like some advice that you've noticed in your years of experience mentoring younger people? Yeah, you mean advice about getting into a program? program or just a job outlook? Sure. Um, well, I would say if you're trying to get into CRNA school, there's so many more resources now than there were even six or seven years ago when I was getting ready to apply and, and trying to go to CRNA school. Back then, you pretty much just Googled CRNA and just found some elusive sites that talked about it a little bit. There was nobody really online. There was no social media CRNAs. There really were not all these resources. Now there's me and a bunch of other people out there who are offering uh, resources. We're offering, you know, our personal lives, pretty much us just talking and showing us, showing you what our daily lives are like going on podcasts, talking about these types of situations. And a lot of us offer things like resume reviews and mock interviews that help prepare you for the actual interview to get into CRNA school and study guides that kind of prep you on some of the information you need to know before you start CRNA school. So I, my advice for people who are looking to go to CRNA school now and trying to get into a program is really use these resources. Go in and, and hook up with some of us who are trying to help mentor you and guide you along and, and use these resources to kind of boost yourself up because it's very competitive to get in. It's always been competitive, but since COVID, I will tell you that I've seen it get much, much more competitive. And the reason why my theory is that uh, the ICU nurses of America saw, and ICU nurses of the world really, but in America specifically we're talking, saw the worst brunt of, I think the ER and the ICU saw the worst brunt of, of the situation with, with COVID, with these COVID patients and long-term ventilation and just burnout and desperate need of them and just being spread too thin. So I believe that a huge percentage of people who maybe would have continued on in the ICU as a nurse for many more years and was kind of complacent, but fine, you know, they, they were happy enough in it, I think quickly decided they were looking for something else and that something else was CRNA school. 
And so you just have a lot more applicants than ever before trying to get into these programs. And the programs, have they're not going to open up more spots than what they used to have. There's a restricted amount of programs and there's a restricted amount of slots available for people to go to CRNA school every year. And that's not changed. All that's changed is the number of people trying to get into those spots. Mm -hmm. So as it's gotten more competitive and as I've mentored people and gotten a lot of people into programs and gotten a lot of feedback from you know people saying, hey, I got in and someone else says, hey, I didn't get in. I'm realizing that you really have to bring your A game. You really have to you know pull out all the stops and use all your resources to, to come in there and be the best you can be. And a lot of times I find it's the interview that really gets people. It's the in-person CRNA school interview that people get in there, they've done all this hard work to prepare themselves, they, they're ready to go, they've done. They've made their A's, they've done their, got their CCR in, they've got their shadowing time experience, they've got their great letters of recommendation, they've done their three years in CVSU and did some sick U and did this and that and the other, they did, they did medical mission trips and all these things to boost up their resume. And they get in there and they don't realize that emotional intelligence is a hu huge portion of, of the interview for CRNA school. Uh, and if you cannot, if you don't understand emotional intelligence and what that means, and you don't know how to relay that in your answers when they're asking you questions throughout the interview, you're going to fall low in the rankings of who they want in their program. And so I tell people like invest in preparing yourself to really rock that interview because that is going to be what makes and breaks who gets in and doesn't. Hmm. I 100% agree with that because in going through nursing school and just like school in general, uh, I was never the best student and I wasn't, I was never the most appealing person on paper, you could say. But a lot of times the way I got out of sticky situations or I got into certain classes or, or schools without being at the top pick is just because of the interview process. Because, you know, you have your candidates on paper, but you can't really discern who, who's the best one because it's just on paper. And you might have like your top five people and on paper, your top five people look exactly the same. But in reality, they're, they're completely different. And even when I interviewed um, some new nurses coming on back in, when I used to work in Chicago uh, or in Oakland, I used to um, I used to help help hire nurses, right? So I all I did was really glance over the resume because if you're a new grad coming in or even a seasoned nurse, as a new grad, I don't really expect much on a on a resume sheet because as long as you got your BS and you passed your NCLEX, that's that's all I gotta know. To be honest, I really. Um, don't look at what school you kind of came from. I, I look at what you did in that school because if you if you've done more things, that means you know how to manage your time, which is which is a benefit. So whatever extracurricular activity you, you put on there, I, I look at. But I really focus more on the interview. And sometimes I interview people that they look really good on paper, but then when I talk to them, it's almost like, hey, did you ever even try like prepping for this? Like your resume looks nice, all that stuff looks nice, but have you ever talk like talk to somebody that is maybe of a of a higher professional level as you and it seems like they they've they they haven't and I usually let people go because if you don't get like a good vibe out of them or if they're not asking questions back or if they don't seem interested enough to ask questions then it just kind of shows that you know they're just like basic you could say. Right. So it's always important to to as much get as much prep as possible because that's only gonna only way you could prep for an interview is going through mock interviews and speaking to people that have gone through interviews because you on a personal level have never really been been through one. And I feel like man, I had a little bit of advantage getting a job because we basically worked full time during school, so we really kind of knew what it takes to land a job. Besides some of my uh, like, except for some of my friends, they didn't really have any kind of job experience. They never worked anywhere. They went to, through through school, and they didn't really know how to you know interact on the interview process. They kind of struggled finding a job. Where man, I we kind of got a job off off the rip. Yeah. Uh, but I was reading something online recently that they're supposed to increase the education requirement for CRNAs in 2025. Do you know, do you know anything about that? Yeah, so yeah. they, in uh, I think about 2015, they started transitioning all of the CRNA programs, the 100 whatever programs that are in America. Mm -hmm. They, um, the AAC, or no, 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 I forget. I've, I've actually blanked totally on the organization that governed over this it's the college of nursing i believe but they they decided that all programs in america that were producing crnas had to be a doctoral program it had to be a doctoral program graduating doctoral students in order for them to take boards uh, after the uh, january 1st 2025 mm -hmm. so that means that if you graduate a program after that day of january 1st 2025 and you don't have a doctorate from you from that program, you're not allowed to take boards and ever actually practice as a CRNA. 
So that's why way back when, I mean, my program that I went to, I graduated July, 2019. My program became doctoral probably 2015, I think. So a lot of programs started transitioning years and years ago. There's, I don't really know of any programs taking on, even now in 2022, who are taking on anyone for a master's program anymore, because in the next couple of years, by the time they would actually graduate, they would be very close to that cutoff line where they would not actually even be allowed to take boards and become a CRNA. So I would say if anyone even is applying today for schools, you should only be, if there happens to still be a lingering master's program, I would not apply to it. I would only be applying to, to doctoral programs because you run a really big risk of, of getting too close to that time period where you won't be allowed to even take boards after going through all of that schooling and paying that tuition. And then going through through all that schooling, did you feel confident coming out of school and did you feel prepared to be a CRNA or did you notice that maybe now that you have been a CRNA for, for quite a bit of time, uh, in certain sections of school, it's lacking what it actually takes to be a CRNA? Because there's always a disconnect between nursing school and what you actually experience in, in, in the healthcare setting. Is there a disconnect like that between CRNA school and being an actual CRNA? It's a really good question because you're right. In nursing school, you go through all of the schooling and training. And I feel like I went through a really good thorough nursing program. My third nursing program was four and a half years long. It was a four and a half year long BSN program. And we did a lot of ICU rotations. We did a lot of stuff that was focused on the specialties. And a lot of us graduated and went straight to the ICU. And I went straight to the ICU as a new grad. And I realized even with all of that time, precepting in the ICU, doing a whole semester before that of all ICU rotations in nursing school, I still felt like I didn't know what the heck I was doing as a new grad nurse. I was like totally out of water. I needed to be, you have to be trained pretty much from the ground up as a new grad, how to actually be a nurse and what it means to be a nurse and develop those kind of intuitions and those things that that nursing brain that you need to, to safely take care of your patients but it's different for CRNA school. So you've already done all that as a nurse, became an ICU nurse, went through at least a few years of training as a nurse where you're you know, getting that experience, you're seeing all these things, you're dealing with medications and, and patients and situations and developing that nurse brain. And then you start your doctoral training as a CRNA. And then you do three years of pretty, the most intense thing I've ever done in my life yeah. of training that really grinds you down and really pushes you way beyond what you thought your limits were. So that by the time you actually do graduate, you're fully capable and ready to be a full practice anesthesia provider. And you, you feel confident in that. And I did for sure. Mm. I want to go back to the emotional intelligence you're mentioning during the interview. So to me, it seems like you need to be confident in what you're saying so they resonate with what you're outputting and answering all those questions. What kind of questions are being asked usually during these interviews that really test that emotional intelligence? The most popular question that I usually advise people on is the question of why do you want to be a CRNA? That is, you can almost bet that is going to be asked to you when you come into CRNA school interviews. And people mistake this to be a time to give objective data that uh, I like the salary, I like the autonomy, I like the um, you know schedule, I like the skills that CRNAs get to practice. I really find the pharmacology interesting. I really love pathophysiology. I really love the OR. I you know all of these types of things that give you all this this these they, their list of what they think is cool about the career of being a CRNA, and that is an instant fail mm -hmm. on that emotional intelligence scale. So they're not looking for a list of, of what it means to be a CRNA as far as like um, surface level answer like that of, of what pretty much anybody can look at a CRNA and say, okay, well, this is their, this is what they do. This is their life. And I want to be that thing. They're looking for a high emotional intelligence answer. They're looking for what it is within you that drives you to want to be this thing. Why do you want to take on all of this responsibility? Why do you want to go in every day knowing that what you're going to do today means someone can live or die based off your actions and you're going to take that on and you're going to take on that responsibility and you're going to take on three years of 70 plus hours a week of sacrifice and work with no breaks and 200 K in student loan debt when you get done. And you're going to do all of this to, to go into a career that's actually going to be quite demanding and, and have very stressful, uh, hard moments for you. So why are you doing this? What can you tell those professors in that moment that will make them think, 
this is what you're destined to do. This is what you want to be. And you're not going to stop until you get there, no matter what. Even when you're two years into the program and you don't see the light at the end of the tunnel and you're exhausted and you've been studying forever and you're, you want to give up and you've been fighting with your spouse and you haven't seen your family in a year and you never go out with your friends anymore and you know you're going to have to keep studying, they want to hear that answer that's going to resonate with them and make them think this person won't give up because this is what they're meant to be. Mm-hmm. And that scores high on emotional intelligence and that's what you want to tell them. Yep, that's some very good advice. Mm. It's basically showing you your passion and purpose for being a CRNA. Mm. Like you're going to be a go-getter and this is what they're looking for. Yeah. Yes. You really got to show yourself. You, you, you got you to gotta be honest with yourself, and especially in like the healthcare field on why you do certain things, not just like the typical standard response because we we go, especially into nursing, so we go, part of, part of us goes to nursing because we like the hours. It's a good idea, we're getting 36 hours, you know, a week, full time, it's nice. You're not doing any kind of serious manual labor. Yeah, you might need to uh, boost somebody up and, and things like that. And it's a little bit more on the cushiony side. So we all understand that we all entered in this room nursing for that same reason. So tell me another reason why you enter nursing because I could relate to you on like these, these job hours, the work experience, all that stuff. but but I can't relate to you on your personal level. So like, let me let me enter the life of Matt in this interview. We gotta, you have to be, be like you said, emotionally smart to be able to um, put that out 100%. And that's yeah. what's gonna dif- differentiate, not necessarily um, everything that you have on your resume. Yeah, because honestly, on paper, there's a, there's a list of what you really need to accomplish and do to even apply to CRNA schools. So you would be surprised. I mean, out of all the people I've mentored and all the mock interviews I've done, people start to really look the same on paper. Mm-hmm. They all say, oh, okay, so you've, done, you've got these three letters of recommendation. You've done this many years in this ICU. Oh, you, you've done, you know, you have a GPA of this and you took a science and you made an A in this chemistry and everybody starts blending together. And so the way that you stand out to actually get picked is for them to really feel you in the interview, connect with you, understand your motivations mm-hmm. and, and score high on emotional intelligence because certain people are not very high in emotional intelligence. And, and if you can display that you are, you stand out amongst the others. Yeah, 100%. And like the goal of the interviewers, I feel like, is not only to hire you as like this person to complete this job, but they also want you to grow in their, their company. So you have to also try to incorporate that into your, into your speech, uh, just to show that, hey, you're not just another pawn that you're gonna work your three out, three years, four years, five years, six, and then leave somewhere else. If you if you wanna be emotionally savvy, you could say is always try to incorporate things like that where your future goals are similar to the future goals that they have for you as well. Because they don't, like I said, they don't want somebody that's gonna come in for a few years and then then leave. They want somebody that's going to potentially pursue management, help change change things up a little bit. Completely, and it's funny you mentioned that because out of all those, you know, 100 whatever programs in the US, each program has slightly different culture, like a, an anesthesia culture that, at their program. And I, I have a good story of an uh, interview that I did at one bigger name school, I won't name them, but they're a well-known name in the world uh, for research and a lot of academic stuff. And I interviewed there and they all seemed to, you know, really like me and everything's clicking well. And then I got waitlisted and I didn't know why I got waitlisted. And then later I was given some feedback that they just felt like I would not be very happy there. Mm -hmm. And at the time I was very upset because that's where I thought I was going to go to school. And I was really dead set on that. And then now that I am a CRNA and I actually have friends that went to that program. And and when I was a nurse anesthesia resident, and I also did attended conferences and things with other students from that program. And I realized they were right. I wouldn't have been happy there. Mm -hmm. That culture with that program, was very much tied to like a bigger academic hospital. It's very much care team assimilated. They very much kind of train you. They do some little bit of rotations where you you learn a little bit of autonomy, but they're 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 very much minded towards team model and working within big hospital systems and that kind of stuff, which is not my personality at all and not what I was seeking, not what I wanted. And I even said that in the interview unknowingly, I said that, you know, my goal was to do as many nerve blocks as I could in training and as many, you know, lines on my own and to do as much CRNA only practice as I could because I was going to do that when I got out of school. And of course they, that's why they said like, we don't think you would be happy here. And, uh, and they were right. So I was, it was a favor to me that they did that honestly, because they were right that I wouldn't be happy there, but the culture, the kind of the flow where I did go to end up going to school 
had a lot more spiritual minded focus. So certain programs do have more of a spiritual focus, not that that changes the curriculum at all, but in general, they just, they want students there who have a spiritual mind. They, they believe in a higher power. They believe in um, that the fact, you know, or I don't want to say fact, but they believe in the idea that, uh, that there is a higher purpose for our, our jobs and what we do and, and how we help people. And they even once a year do medical mission trips and they take the students with them to, you know, a country where you do that. And so that's much more up my alley of where, where I come from and my beliefs and, and my feelings. And so I, I clicked with that culture, but there may be another person, if you're like completely athe atheist and you believe in nothing like that, you would not probably enjoy that because there were times where the professors would pray before an exam and pray over us before we took the exam and just say, we, we pray that they learn everything they have needed to learn and that they do well in this exam today. And so that's what I mean. Medical culture can definitely change um, based from program to program. You need to find where you fit in. It's a crazy concept to think about. You don't, you don't take that into consideration applying for schools. There's these different cultures. And a couple of interviews ago, we interviewed somebody from hospice and she mentioned a lot about the spirit how if you're going to help your patients and have compassion you need to believe in this higher power so i see how there's different um i want to use the word brands different brands of anesthesia schools that have their philosophy that you stand out oh you went to that school that kind of um uh stigma you can say so that, that's cool yeah if i see like a if i'm interviewing somebody for a job like a crna or a doctor and if they went to if i've, if I've seen like harvard versus like I don't know what, what else is out there. What school did you go to? Hinsdale or something? Hinsdale University. <laughs> and if I compare Hinsdale University versus Harvard University, that healthcare professional that I'm interviewing is definitely going to get a lot harder questions. The Harvard person is definitely going to get grilled and bombed compared to you know the other person because if they're because you know we always have that associated with, with, with like prestige. Oh, they went to this school, they went to that school. Doesn't necessarily 100 always mean that 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 candidate's going to be a better candidate. But it's just like you, you want to. You kind of want to test them more because, oh, you went to this school, uh, see, see what you know, you know. I honestly get that uh, in jiu-jitsu because mm -hmm. I have the 10th Planet shirt on. They see that when I'm in this ring in San Diego and they want to go roll with me, mm -hmm. see what this guy got because he's from that gym. Mm -hmm. So I see that coming into play. <laughs> yeah, and pl plus we're dudes. So there's always that, comp that competition mindset in there always yeah. too. Totally. Yeah. Do you these programs want you to represent them too. So in the anesthesia world is so small that when you graduate a program, people will ask you the rest of your life. Like people, when I became a nurse, people really didn't go like, well, where did you go to nursing school? Like no one really cared. But in CRNA world or, or anesthesia world in general, people will ask you, oh, where did you train? Oh, I, you trained at that school? Oh, okay. So you're you're known for this or or that school's known for that or something. And so there is there's a lot of that that you represent and the programs expect you to represent them and they want to pick students who they think are going to represent them well in the world of anesthesia when you graduate and you go out there. Yeah. I used to ask for that question too like like where did you learn that from? Like and they always give me like a basic response of you know this place that place. And I stopped asking that and I started asking like how did you learn that? And then, because that way, they don't tell me like like where they learned it from, but they actually explain to me how they learned it. So then they kind of lets me steal that information from them almost. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like a it's, it's, it's a, a trick. It's a, it's a, flip -flop, a trick. Bro. Oh, it's a networking <laughs> trick. Are you still in the very uh, do, uh, female dominant profession being a CRNA, or did it shift from being like a bedside ICU nurse? So yeah, it shifts a lot. It's really odd when you you go from years of being in nursing school and then you're in, in an ICU nurse for years and you feel like you're surrounded by a lot more women and the higher percentage of women. Although I will say the ICU and the ER has probably the highest concentration of, of male nurses. Okay. You're gonna have a lot more male nurses in those two areas. So um, so yeah, you, I had a little bit more of that in the ICU, but when you start um, CRNA school, it becomes like 50-50. And pretty much the world of anesthesiology is like 50-50. So it's it's almost sad in a way because you you are used to being this minority that you're like this weird oddity or whatever when you're a male nurse and you're kind of like special in a way. But then you go into CRNA school and you're suddenly like, oh, that's ripped away from you. Like you're not special at all. You're just another 50%. Half of you are male and half of you are female. And it's, uh, it's not special anymore. Yeah, not exclusive. Mm. Not exclusive. Yeah, it's kind of boring. <laughs> Has the CRNA title uh, given you the, the ability to land more of a nurse's phone numbers? <laughs> <laughs> the hospital setting? 
for for certain i am not the i am not the like flirt kind of guy in fact i'm the kind of guy that somebody can be flirting with me pretty overtly and i don't i don't recognize it and then somebody near me is like what were you doing like that just blinks And, and I'm, I'm like, well, I, th- I think she was just being nice. She was just talking to us about Lord of the Rings for whatever reason. It's like, <laughs> yeah. you know, watch that movie. She's talking about it because you were talking about it. Yeah. Like, oh, okay, I had no idea. Hey, she so happens to love it just as much as you, bro. <laughs> just <laughs> that day. Just that, just that day. <laughs> I was like, Gandalf's pretty cool. She was into it. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. but yeah, so not me. But now I do have buddies that definitely um, go on quite a few dates. I'll say that. Mm. But, but you got to be careful because... At, as you start earning more money, mm-hmm. you will start finding more people are interested in you for the wrong reasons. And so you just got to be careful when people, if they know what your profession is, like they're flirting with you at work and they know that you're a CRNA or they know you're a physician and anesthesiologist or something, and they're looking for, you know, to cash in on something, then mm-hmm. you just got to be careful about the wrong kind of attraction you're getting. Uh, hopefully you're just meeting them organically. And, and I do have friends that literally won't say in female, like female CRNAs, a lot of them will not tell people that on dating apps or in even meeting them at uh, restaurants or something, they won't tell them. They'll say, uh, they'll say they work in healthcare or they won't be specific about what they do because they actually find that it, whereas for men, I suppose there is a decent amount of times that it works in your favor, but for the wrong reasons. For females, it actually works against them. I have I've found from their mm. input that that men don't like that they have a doctorate. They don't like that they make that much money. They don't like it, and they're actually turned off by it uh, a lot of times. And so they will hide that from them as long as possible, as messed up as that is. Yeah, I guess definitely that happening. But I've never had an issue. Hey, if if a woman comes along and wants to pay the bills, I gotta be a stay at home dad, or watch the kids, and go to the gym, work out like three hours a day. Hey, I'm chilling. You can you can have whatever title you want. You could be, you know, the CEO of like SpaceX or whatever, man. That, that's a, yeah. I never understood that. It's there's, I mean, there's I, a lot I, of simping going on. Let's yeah. just say like how it is. Yeah, man. <laughs> like just because it's a female doesn't mean that that she, like you feel less of a man if she has a higher title than you. Like I'd be like you know, I'm no, like, I like it. I'd be like I I'll, I'll be like you know push as much as I can every dinner I'll be like hey do you know my wife's a CEO of this I'll be trying to get like, free dinners and shit you know <laughs> I, I, I push it that way I'd be like for sure if she's a higher title you know, that makes my life a little bit easier I feel like oh she has discounts on the Marriott hotels yeah, yeah. but but of course I would still prefer to be the, 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 the breadwinner of the household but if I'm not I'll take that L but I'll, I'll <laughs> take W on everything else Oh no! I I love the idea of both of us challenging each other to keep mm. earning more and more to see who who is making the most yeah. and then it's like a competition it's you know? just kind of and I like how you mentioned just you got to go back to motion intelligence and verify that's happening organically and doesn't have some underlying um, issues mm-hmm. or some kind of trauma that's being attached to for the wrong reasons. But it's crazy as you get older and you since we're talking about dating, it it changes the perspective of what you're looking for and what's mm-hmm. uh, exactly attractive to you. Finances is you. the number one reason for fights in divorce. Mm-hmm. I've been told from lawyers, divorce lawyers. So. I, the older I get and the more dates I've gone on, the more serious relationships I've been in, the more I've found that if you don't, if you don't have the same ideologies on finances or the same kind of um, motivations as far as finances go, it's, it's kind of a doomed uh, venture for you to go on. So I, I usually just avoid it if I can. I try and, you know, do away with that stress level. Yeah, communication is super important. That's why I'm always like off the rip. I always tell people to to always be honest. Like if someone's bothering you let somebody know because then either maybe they could explain it why it shouldn't bother you or you'll just you know or, or, or they'll change i feel like there's a lot of miscommunication and that a lot of time leads to leads to divorce that's why i'm always very open in, in the beginning because because you're just, just not sure on what the person's background is what they agree on what they what they believe in and you know we're all agreeable to a certain extent so i feel like all our minds could be changed and it's just about finding like a good 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 medium and you can't find a really good medium if you don't communicate with, with like if you're angry with something or you're sad or frustrated or even things that make you happy because sometimes people would know what their significant others um, frustrations are but they won't know what makes them happy so it's like they know what makes them tick but they don't know what calms them down which is which is kind of crazy to think about mm-hmm. uh, since yeah, we're talking yeah. about relationships might as well i was listening to a podcast before about relationships and they brought up like the three elements that you must have aligned somewhat to work out Mm. and they said it has to be value vision and lifestyle so you guys Mm. are kind of talking about this and it kind of goes into those three categories that if you're aligned 
in these specific aspects, you have that better chance mm. of working out long term because you know that a relationship isn't all happiness. It's just a growing process mm. of just like anything else. Yeah, yeah. And even the sort of value, vision, and, and what was lifestyle. One? And lifestyle. It's completely, uh, yeah, I, I agree with that because like as long as like the, the core values are, are about the same, you can work on the other things. And the vision has to be the same. It could be a, in a different field. Like you could have like an athlete and a, like a healthcare worker, completely different spectrums. But as long as their vision is to like, for example, get better, and they both have that get better vision, well, then that's still going to work. And what was the other one? Value, vision, and lifestyle. And lifestyle, so yeah. It, it could be you liking working out, you liking a specific sport, maybe you align there. Maybe that person has to value uh, religion. So they're, they ha that criteria has to be checked off of believing in a higher power. So whatever it is, and the people that are li listening, just ask yourself, well, what are those three for you? And then you can kind of pick out of the ocean of fish that are out there. And I feel like the biggest, biggest thing, not to take up too much time here, but I feel like the biggest thing for a lot of night shift workers is the is a third point that, that, you, that you made the lifestyle because relationships might be going great but the fact that one person works nights one person works days it's just it, it's a compromise in the beginning but i think over time if they don't really have a solid foundation of communication it deteriorates the relationship because partners both partners are up and awake at different parts of the day and it's really hard to be on the same level. I feel like NYCHA does that, does a big negative for, for lifestyle for people like that. They're trying to get into relationship because a lot of people do nights. It's the biggest oh, man. I used to, a lot of groups make you do call as a, as a anesthesia provider. And I, the group that I was previously at before I went to 1099, you had to do 24 hours or 16 hour call at least once a week. And that usually 24 hours, of course, 24 hours, 7 a, 7 a the next day, but um, 16 hours started at 3 p.m. And then you went till 7 a.m. the next day. And you're always wasted the day after. Your post-call day is just, it's, you can give it up. You're not gonna get anything productive done. You're not gonna have conversations. I, I didn't want people to call me. Like I didn't wanna have a phone conversation with people. And I never really, I was really just shocked by some of my coworkers that were like married with a three-year-old at home or something. And they would get done with their 24 hour shift and they would go home and sleep for like two hours and then slap themselves awake and then get up and start taking care of this kid and like trying to take care of their you know spouse and de deal with those things and stuff. So it, you're right, night shift working people who have to do stuff like that, they really, um, they, they I props to them because I don't know how they do it because I barely took my dog for a walk post-call day. Like he barely got a walk at all. That was it. Yeah, that, that's, that's true, man. Like night shift drains you emotionally, physically, everything everything just gets good drain especially <laughs> spiritual especially in your relationship like over time it's it takes a toll it's yeah. definitely rough shout out to all the night shift workers out there that's why you guys gotta get paid a little bit more than the days and if you've never done nights and you're done day shift nurse that complains about nights like try it because it sucks it's wrong jason where can people find you I, you can find me on youtube i'm bolt crna over there i've had youtube videos up since 2015 and uh, I'm also on Instagram, Bolt CRNA over there, and TikTok, and that's Bolt CRNA there too. So come follow me for some poopy stuff. Or if you want those mock interviews, it's on my Instagram in my bio. You click the link. And uh, I also do strategy sessions. So if you're not ready for a mock interview and you just want to talk about going to CRNA school and getting your ducks in a row, and maybe you're a couple of years from that point, I also do strategy sessions for people who are in that stage too. So same link. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time, Jason. Really appreciate you. Yeah, it's been great. Thanks for uh, for talking everything from CRNA to three dudes talking about relationship advice here, but we got the secret scoop. So thank you, and I'm sure you'll be back on again. We'll talk. Yeah, I'd love to, guys. Take care. Bye.